yeah. A heroic janitor hops in an escape pod and embarks on a quest to save the galaxy. The game's designers spoof pop culture icons like the Blues Brothers, ZZ Top, and of course Star Wars and Star Trek. However, some of the homages got them in hot water. The depiction of Droids Are Us upset a certain very large toy company, but Sierra simply changed the name to Droids Be Us to avoid any legal troubles. Space Quest was the first adventure game to include a live action puzzle and an arcade sequence. The game was very challenging and players died often, very often. So to quell potential frustration with the game, the designers added sarcastic remarks that questioned a player's intellect. It worked so well that players started killing off poor Roger just for the fun of it. Eventually, Roger earns the golden mop for saving the galaxy, and soon he's a celebrity. Likewise, Space Quest became pretty popular itself, selling over 100,000 units. Mark Crow and Scott Murphy jokingly named themselves the two guys from Andromeda. Fans ate it up and anxiously anticipated a sequel. In 1987, Sierra released Space Quest II. Sludge Vohal, a thinly veiled spoof of Darth Vader, abducts Roger and sends him to rot in a labor camp. From there, Roger must find a way to stop Vohal's army of cloned life insurance salesmen, and quick. Roger saves the day, but his efforts leave him floating through space in a cryogenically frozen state. Soon, improved technology would take the franchise to warp speed. Two years later, a garbage freighter rescued Roger in Space Quest III, The Pirates of Pestulon. The trademark spoofs continued when Roger fixes the aluminum mallard, think Millennium Falcon, does battle with a debt collector named Arnoid the Annihilator, and dines at a familiar looking monolith burger. While playing a game of Astro Chicken, Roger discovers a distress message from none other than the two guys from Andromeda. Elmo Pug has kidnapped them and is forcing the two guys to make crappy games. Soon, Roger is on another quest to save the galaxy and the video game industry. Sierra's new SCI game engine provided a richer color palette and clearer audio. And Space Quest 3 was the first game ever to feature a score composed by a major recording artist, Supertramp drummer Bob Siebenberg. The game won more awards than any Sierra title before it and set the stage for the greatest title in the entire franchise. In 1991, Space Quest 4, better known as Roger Wilco and the Time Rippers, was released. Sierra spent a million dollars on production and packed the game with upgrades and peculiarities. SQ4 included full speech support, and the designers tapped Gary Owens of Laugh-In fame to narrate their new story. Who was that guy with the overdeveloped hair dryer? Why are you talking to yourself? Roger Wilco must stop the sequel police from destroying any past and future versions of Space Quest. Roger travels to Space Quest 1, where monochromatic bikers ridicule his improved color palette. What's this? 256 colors all for one little bitmap whip? To Space Quest X, latex babes of Estros, a parody of Infocom's leather goddesses of Phobos, and to Space Quest 12, where he meets a familiar foe, Sludge Vohal. Surprised to see an old friend? SQ4 also introduced a large handful of Easter eggs. One featured a Space Quest programmer buying underwear, another transported Roger to a volcanic planet from Space Quest 3, where he melts, and another shut down the game. Sierra's million dollar investment paid off. Roger Wilco and the Time Rippers sold more copies than the first three Space Quest adventures combined but it would be the last game designed by the two guys from Andromeda. 
A short-lived comic book series debuted in 1992 at about the same time Scott Murphy left Sierra, leaving Mark Crow to design 1993's Space Quest V, Roger Wilco and the Last Mutation. It was the first game in the franchise to have a major sponsor, Sprint. Roger Wilco cheats his way through his StarCon training and earns his very own command on, what else? A garbage freighter, the SCS Eureka, that resembled an oversized vacuum. This time, Roger battles Captain Rains T. Quirk, the most notable of many Star Trek parodies, who is spreading a mutagenic disease. Along the way, Roger is transformed into a fly, battles a WD-40 droid, adopts a familiar alien-looking pet, bumps into Elvis, and even witnesses the classic lightsaber fight between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi. The Star Trek spoofs continued in 1995 with Space Quest VI, The Spinal Frontier. Gary Owens returned to the franchise. Scrump off, you little Monger. But Mark Crow didn't. Midway through production, the other guy from Andromeda, Scott Murphy, became the lead programmer. Roger returns to StarCon headquarters after saving the galaxy in SQ-5, only to be court-martialed for breaking some minor laws. Roger is demoted to janitor second class and is assigned to the SCS Deep Ship 86, a parody of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And in a nod to inner space, Roger undergoes miniaturization and enters the body of his new love interest. Unfortunately, Space Quest VI would be the last official release in the Space Quest series. In 1997, Sierra announced the release of Space Quest VII, but the game was put on hold. Rumors surfaced again in 2002, but the game was eventually nixed. The turmoil spurred fans to create two playable games in hopes of reviving the beloved franchise. But the game's future looks grim. At its core, Space Quest was a franchise that never took itself too seriously. It stood out from the crowd by featuring an underdog as its hero, and much like Roger Wilco saving the galaxy, the game has had an everlasting effect, perhaps greater than they ever anticipated. Thank <laughs> you.